they were there for my triumphs, for my failures. So if I was ever failing at something, they were there to pick me up uh, emotionally and support me and be like, you know, this isn't the end of the world. You can always recover from this. And uh, having them there was uh, one of the best decisions that I've ever made. So hi, everyone, and welcome to the Student Influencers Podcast. So I'm here with Hamza. So thank you for joining us today. And Thanks for having me. Awesome. So we usually start with some kind of basic get to know you kind of questions. Um, so let's start with where are you currently located? So I'm uh, in, in Ajax, so it's about an hour from Toronto, right. but uh, still going to University of Toronto. Right. Um, and so where were you born? Uh, I was born in Houston, Texas. Oh, really? How did you yeah. end up at uh, U, U of T? Um, my, I actually, so my family ended up moving down to Canada when I was about like two years old. So we permanently relocated. My dad ended up getting a job in, uh, in Canada. So yeah, it was, uh, the most pragmatic choice. It was also an hour away from where I live. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. And, and, um, do you ever go back? Like to, um, yeah, to actually like, do you have family annually. There? Yeah. Yeah. So we go for Christmas. Um, uh, my uncle and all my cousins are there. So it's cool. We, yeah, we frequent Texas. That must be uh, quite a difference, though, in the because isn't it hot all year round there? Um, no, actually, oh, really? in December it's uh, yeah, it's like I'd say it's like fall weather, maybe like slightly warmer fall weather here. Um, but yeah, it can it can get quite cold, maybe huh. by quite cold, not maybe by Canadian standards, but I mean up to like ten degrees or something or five degrees. Oh, that's interesting. I always kind of thought <laughs> it would just be super hot there since it's so south. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it gets reasonably cold for sure. Wow. Good to know. Interesting. Um, what major are you taking? Oh, I know you, you are, um, you finished a BA at U of T and now you're applying to law school. Is that right? Yeah. So, uh, I just finished a, a BA in, uh, peace, conflict and justice studies and ethics, society and law. So they're both, uh, interdisciplinary programs. That's interesting. And then you yeah. just applied. Do you want to know more about them? Or? Yeah, go <laughs> they're, ahead. They're kind of funky. Yeah, they're yeah, kind of interesting. The... Um, I, I know most people tend to scratch their head when I say peace, conflict, and justice studies and ethics, society, and law. And they're like, what does that even mean? <laughs> um, I feel like a very conventional uh, way of doing things on your way to law school is political science or international relations. And mm -hmm. these are actually not disciplines that exist um, academically. So this is an interdisciplinary approach to understanding precisely the themes of peace, conflict, and justice, for example, um, where you're studying IR, you're studying sociology, sociobiology in some instances, um, political sciences, uh, history, geography, like it, it's a mix of everything. And so, for example, if you're trying to study a conflict like Rwanda, um, they'll give you all the aspects surrounding the conference uh, surrounding the concept of Rwanda and the Rwanda genocide in 1994 um so that way you get a more holistic understanding of uh what happened down there oh that's interesting so it's more like a yeah. more of a um, like a global peacekeeping kind of scale as opposed to like a your average justice system like within like say a prov provincial court or something like that yeah, precisely. So the ethics society and law, that's the, I'm double majoring. So mm -hmm. the second major would probably, uh, it, it could be anything, I guess. It depends on the way that you decide to, it's almost like a build your own degree. So for ethics society and law, I chose to, to focus more on immigration and like refugee law. Um, and that also went hand in hand with what I was doing for peace, conflict and justice, which I think tends to take a more global approach, although it doesn't necessarily have to because you select the courses that you want to put into it. Right. Interesting. Um, what got you into that? Um, I, quite frankly, I think it was a misunderstanding of what the program was. <laughs> um, I, I, I hope that I definitely learned my lesson. Um, right. but yeah, so I looked at, for ethics, society, and law, I always knew that I was interested in law. So that was kind of a straightforward, uh, a shot for it because, um, when, when you're studying law, you're studying all the concomitants of it as well with it when you're in law school. So ethics, the spirit of the law, that sort of stuff. Um, how you're supposed to conduct yourself within the legal field. Um, and then society, I guess, is what formulates the law, what framework it works around. Um, and then law, obviously, is the central the mm -hmm. core of going into legal studies. Um, and then the other major, peace, conflict, and justice studies, I was under the impression that that was more like social justice oriented. 
Um, I took a social justice course in my first year and I was like, wow, this seems quite interesting. It's definitely a lens that I haven't seen before. Um, and, I, and I wanted to work towards that. And instead of doing equity studies, I thought that I would do something that's a little bit more diverse. So I thought it meant peace, conflict and justice within society, not internationally. Um, and I was in for a rude awakening. Um, <laughs> even after, after doing this interview and everything, I still was um, under this misunderstanding of what the program was based around. So it, it, was, it was an interesting uh, first couple of weeks until I <laughs> realized like, wow, I've signed up for something that's totally different from what I imagined. But you stuck with it. So you obviously like, yeah, it. no, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> and I think uh, the programs, if, if I could put out a recommendation for it, um, for, for the both of them, they're, they're quite difficult to get into in terms of the credentials and the academic requirements that they have, or the thresholds are quite high. So the people that you meet, I think, is what the most important takeaway is from that program, that uh, it, in, it increases your intellectual academic capabilities because you're surrounded by people who really push you to do a lot more than you, than you tend to do before. Right. So it's a lot of networking. That's a big aspect of it, I guess. Yeah, I think I think it's networking, but also the class sizes are small. And uh, I think more than learning from the material, the content, the readings, I learned more from everybody who was around me, which is uh, quite interesting. I don't know if everybody can say that within their undergraduate degree. The yeah, people definitely. that were around them taught them so much. Yeah. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience like that, too, because I went to school for journalism. And it was the same kind of thing. Like all of our classes were really small sized. And our professors were they weren't like PhD professors. They were actual journalists. So oh, wow. it was more, it was almost just like conversation based with them where they were just talking about their own experiences. And it was kind of very similar to what you're talking about, except with yep. obviously with journalism. <laughs> but yeah, so I get that. I get why that's uh, more valuable too. So just a different experience, I guess. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, so you said that you had told me the other day you were applying to like really top law schools like Harvard and Columbia. What is that process like? I bet that's pretty intimidating. Uh, I mean, it was. I, I just had my uh, NYU interview the day before yesterday. And man, you really break out in sweats. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think for me uh, personally, it was a lot more difficult than the average applicant um, because a lot of the people who tend to get accepted have taken a year off or two years off. And I know people who have applied to these types of schools and who formulate their lives around getting into an Ivy league law school. Mm -hmm. And when you've constructed your life to fit into their statistics, it tends to work in your favor for sure. So if you take right. about uh, a year to two off, they tend to look at that uh, as a very positive uh, source of experience, which I'm coming straight out of my undergrad. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I'm kind of like a, a fresh graduate. I don't know if, in the same lens, whether I have the same benefits, right? Yeah. Um, in terms of the application itself, uh, I think it's quite standard for all law schools. Um, some, some law schools will have like a slight variation for them. So like Harvard has like an optional statement, like a diversity statement. Not all, not all schools have that. Um, I think NYU had uh, a lot of in, in, sorry, there were in-application scholarships. Mm -hmm. which was uh, different from Columbia and Harvard. So Columbia and Harvard have merit-based scholarships only. Um, NYU, uh, sorry, Columbia and Harvard had financial need-based scholarships only. And mm -hmm. then NYU offers uh, financial aid based on merit. Um, so I think that was one of the key differences in terms of essay writing, that the preparation for NYU was a lot of a higher level because you had to do, suppose like you're applying for 10 scholarships, which you know right. in the long run is definitely going to be worth it. Uh, you, you end up spending hours on top of hours trying to write these essays. Um, and in my case, my applications weren't as thoroughly thought through because some of the schools I just hadn't imagined I would be in a place to apply to. Right. So like, like a school like NYU, I didn't apply to until like late January, I think, um, which is way past the average application, which is they, you're supposed to aim for like October for the right. cycle. Um, so I guess that sort of indicates where I was at. And I only applied because they, they sent me a fee waiver and I was like, wow, NYU, like that's a huge school. I had never imagined a school like NYU would be reaching out yeah. to me. And then <laughs> you look in and you're like, this is an amazing school. Why not take my shot? Right. Yeah. Well, what's the risk that you're taking by just applying, even if, even if you think it's a long shot, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I know it's a, it's a little bit more work. Um, 
and something like like Harvard Law School when I was looking at the application I'm like looking at their medians and I'm like wow these are high expectations like I mean it's Harvard Law after all right, right. Um, and, and I was running there, there are these regressions that you can find online and they, they do it just based off of like your hard statistics. So your LSAT, your, your media, your GPA, where you fall around their class media, the time that you're applying even influences, uh, your, your opportunity to get into the school. Um, Mm -hmm. and for Harvard law, things were not extremely favorable for me. We'll leave it at that. (laughs) And, And I was like, okay, but you know, there, there's still a chance on that regression. So why not? take the application. Yeah. Let's see, let's see where we can land. And, and I ended up getting waitlisted. So. Oh, really? That's I mean, awesome. Yeah. I got waitlisted uh, for Harvard, Columbia and NYU. So. <laughs> That's actually really incredible considering yeah. you were, you were kind of applying thinking like this might be a long shot, but to get waitlisted is really great. Yeah. Yeah. It means that uh, they're definitely considering you. And uh, I think for two of those schools, uh, Harvard being one of them, the mobility rates are quite high. So, you know, I'm going to remain optimistic until August and we'll see. We'll see where I end up. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Like not not a lot of people get to say that they even applied to Harvard and all of those top schools. Yeah. And that's that's part of the reason that I did apply, because I'm like one day I'm going to look down the line and be like, you know, there might have been only even if it was like a 5% chance, a 30% chance or whatever, something nominal that you consider isn't worth your time applying for. But if I go like 10, 15 years down the line, I'm like, you know, I could have potentially gone to Harvard Law School or at least have like yeah. tested my chances. I don't want to regret it. So I thought, why not yeah. shoot the shot, right? Or you'll be somewhere down the line thinking, hey, remember that time I applied to Harvard? <laughs> like, yeah. That was yeah. pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, even if you get rejected, I don't understand why you wouldn't take the opportunity, right? Like, exactly. if you get rejected, you're like, at least I, like I, I tried and the bridge wasn't there. So right. it wasn't my fault. It wasn't a failure of my, my effort. Right. That's awesome. At least you get, you're staying positive, too. Like, that's really, it's about that life experience, too. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it was close to like 25% of their waitlisted applicants end up making it into their uh, oh, really? end up matriculating. Yeah. So it's not, you know, the there's odds aren't, hope. yeah, there's still hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did that take a lot of, like, I'm sure you had to do a lot of research when you're applying. Cause there's probably, um, like you said, there was a lot of specific requirements involved. Like, yeah. I'm sure that took. Yeah. So I think the, the main two statistics that are necessary um, it, for any law school, this, this is, uh, across the board ubiquitous is LSAT and then your GPA. Um, and then you, you have smaller factors. Um, some, it depends on the school as well, whether they take a holistic approach or not. So like you have personal statements, but that's also a very subjective indicator, right? Um, mm-hmm. you have things like your resume, also another subjective indicator. What type of person are they looking for? Potentially you have interviews, another very subjective indicator. So those are the two major indicators that you, you know, if you get them right, you can't mess it up, right? You're, yeah. You know that a number is objectively high or not, or what percentile you land on for the LSAT. Um, I think, yeah. In, in terms of uh, in terms of that, I definitely was uh, succeeding in like just making sure that I was doing the research, the requisite research. Um, the subjective part, like you know, you try your best and uh, you got to work with what you have. Mm-hmm. By the by the end of this cycle of the applications, I feel like I memorized like every single statistic on the class profile. <laughs> and, and that's just pure. I think when, when people are applying, there's a little, a, a level of high stress and anxiety. Mm-hmm. So you're always checking like, will I meet this threshold? And somebody who's still in school, who's able to um, manipulate whatever the numbers are, because I still have an entire fourth year by the time that I'm submitting my application. Right. right. Um, so that GPA can still go up significantly and potentially even an LSAT can go up significantly if you're on the wait list, right? Because you can rewrite it and then resubmit. Oh, yeah, that's true. So yeah, I definitely, I, I was certainly focused on that. I was looking at uh, what type of classes, uh, what type of grades I would need in all my classes. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's always just been the type of person that I am. I'll be like on this assignment, I need whatever X, Y, or Z on the grade calculator to finish with this mark. Um, and I think, part of succeeding in undergraduate degrees, especially in a school like University of Toronto, that's uh, notoriously difficult, mm-hmm. is uh, making sure that, you know, even like the fine details that uh, the average person will be like, all right, if I, am, if I land roughly at an 82 versus like an 82.3 is exactly what I need to finish right. with this GPA, which is, uh, I know it sounds really taxing, but uh, sometimes <laughs> no, it's No, I get it, I get it. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that's a pretty, that whole field of law is very, I'm sure it's very competitive and very uh, specific. So, I mean, that makes sense to me, even, even just like a 0.3 difference in your marks. I could see that being a big factor. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, there's other indicators, like, like I mentioned, uh, I think it was about 80% of their class for, for Harvard Law School, around the same for Columbia, I think, took at least a year off from college before going into their, uh, their professional degree. Mm-hmm. So like that, that sort of indicates what increases my chances, what would be the best life choice for me to make at this moment to ensure at least a higher rate of success for entry. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just at the point in my life where I, I don't, think I want to take a year off I don't know how much it would benefit me aside from you know changing the the school the institution name where I get my degree from right uh, ultimately I I think I'm going to end up in the same spot at the end of the day right yeah that makes sense um do you have any other tips or insights that you can share about this process or anyone who's looking to um kind of follow the same study path I guess is the word I'm looking for yeah absolutely so I think um Knowing exactly where you want to go from, and this is tough, right? Because at this mm-hmm. point, I guess me giving you this advice uh, or you soliciting this advice already indicates that you're interested in the legal field, right? But yeah. if, if you have an interest in the legal field, I'd say the earlier you can say it with conviction, the better off you'll be. So you know exactly what the prerequisite steps are, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I guess for the four years that you're in undergraduate, you know, when, when you're studying for your under, undergraduate degree, the best thing to do is uh, maintain high grades. Like that is pivotal. That's all, that all, that's all that matters. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, if you can do extracurriculars, I guess it depends on what the type of, the type of school that you're trying to go to. I think within, uh, within Canada, you have U of T, Western, Osgood, um, Queens. Um, those are the major schools, McGill as well, major top law schools. Right. Um, I think they have, uh, they're really great schools, but they have a little bit less, less emphasis on extracurriculars um, simply by like how much traffic they get in their application system, right? Mm-hmm. A school like Harvard, Columbia, um, NYU, Stanford, Yale, they have an even higher expectation for extracurriculars because they have a bunch of people applying within the 99.9th percentile to their right. schools. Um, and they're looking for ways to reject people at this point, right? Yeah. Um, so it depends now, once you've made that decision of going to law school, now you want to see what type of tier of law school you want to go to. Do you want to be the type of person who's going to, you know, work 90, hundred hours a week and you want to put yourself through that so you could be at the very top? Um, or potentially do you want to have like a more moderate lifestyle or like what exactly you're pursuing, right? You have to mm-hmm. make that decision. Um, and then once you've made that decision, I guess you could construct what exactly your undergraduate degree should look like. I, uh, thankfully I didn't have the problem of doing that, um, because I didn't even consider this, um, right. and it, it ended up working out in my favor because I pursued things that I was interested in. Um, and I did it for just like the joy of doing it myself. Yeah. Like I did like charity work. I worked for, uh, various not-for-profit organizations. Um, I had a job on the side, you know, did sports and whatnot. Um, and those are things that are obviously smiled upon, right. By admissions mm-hmm. officers. But that just, uh, it, it just happened to be coincidental that uh, the things that I truly enjoy doing are also very positively viewed. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, that works out perfectly, right? Um, what are some of your kind of after law school, what are some of your long-term goals? This is um, an interesting question. This is one of the questions that I got within my interview. Um, <laughs> my answer is quite uh, unconventional. And okay. I... If you are going to answer a law school question within an interview, maybe don't take the unconventional <laughs> route. <laughs> but uh, I, I, just, I, would, I would prefer to be genuine about it. And it's uh, more so, I think I don't exactly know where I plan on ending up. I do know that I want to work in refugee law um, and immigration law and help okay. families and resettlement. Um, and that's something that it's like a personal goal that's quite dear to me. But I don't know how, that, how that's going to manifest, whether it's going to be a lawyer opening my own firm perhaps like, you know, a legislature, a legislator or a policymaker or whatever it is. Um, ideally, uh, I would open my own firm. That's something that I've always liked uh, the idea of just like spearheading my own project. Um, but, you know, I never know how, how life's going to work out, how things are going to unfold. So I never like to decide, suppose like 25 years down the line, right? right. Um, now, that being said, I think there is one thing that I do have control of. 
um, and it's determining what type of person I want to be in the future. Okay. So that that's more so my response from where I want to be 25 years from now, suppose, isn't being responded through like a professional avenue, but more so a personal avenue. And it's just like, hopefully one day, um, the best person that I can be. And I know it's very cliche and cheesy, but uh, you know, somebody who can come home and inspire their kids and their, and their wife or, um, you know, everybody around them, their family and whatnot, and just like go to sleep and be happy with yourself because you made ethical choices and ethical decisions. And I know it seems extremely appealing to be making a six, six figure wage. Um, but like working a hundred hours a week, and not being able to see your family, it just doesn't seem very fulfilling to me. Yeah, it's definitely a sacrifice that some people are okay making and other people, it's just not for them. Yeah. So, I mean, that makes sense. And I don't, also, I don't think that's a cheesy mindset at all. I think that's really positive. I think that, um, you know, who you are reflects more than how much money you make or what job you have. So I think that's definitely a positive outlook to have and I think I would be if I was an interviewer I think I would be impressed by that answer if I was a law school I don't know administrator uh, admissions officer, yeah. <laughs> yeah, admissions <Thank> officer. <laughs> um so yeah and I guess we'll see how it goes um you mentioned before um that you were involved in like charity work and extra extracurriculars in school um what kind of work did that involve what did you do for that um so in my first year actually not a whole lot um i think i was still trying to get the grasp of everything and and feel what university life is like um and my second year is when i really started jump start things uh, i ended up working at the legislative assembly in the parliamentary protocol and public relations branch that was a big step for me. Um, and then also I started work towards uh, like more trouble one, four, six. I'm working on, I'm working on uh, incorporating a charity right now. Uh, it's like a family thing. My, my dad and his uh, friends have been working on COVID relief in Pakistan. So they're oh, sending really? ration. Yeah. So right now we have the, the privilege and the benefit of getting CRB, CSB as Canadian citizens, right? Right. Yeah. Um, in Pakistan, there is no such thing as like that social safety net, right? Mm -hmm. So there's people who must remain quarantined because it's the law, but they also mm -hmm. have no source of livelihood. So that's become a huge issue in Pakistan. So my dad has been, and his friends have just been collecting funds and then they've been creating ration packages and they've been sending it overseas. And I think they've fed about 500 families as of now. Really? Yeah, so it's a huge thing, and it, it lasts about uh, the, the package feeds a family of four for about uh, a month. Oh, wow. And yeah, yeah, so, and, and it's actually quite amazing how many people have mobilized to do this. There's people from, like, Etobicoke, who my dad hasn't spoken to in years, who are reaching out to him, and they're like, you know, we want in, we want to support this. And uh, they've raised almost $20,000. I think it was about $16,000 for this. Wow. Um, to the point that we're like, okay, we should start issuing tax receipts. So we should probably incorporate as a charity, right? Yeah. So uh, what's that? What is the, have you have a name for that organization? Obviously, if you're incorporating it, you do. Yes, uh, it's called a, a global identity. So we've actually also applied for a research grant with the University of Toronto. So we're trying to do a research project associated with this. And the premise is basically that when people there, there's a dehumanization with poverty initially, but then yeah. when those people who are impoverished are overseas, that tends to dehumanize them or even like disconnect that level of empathy across borders. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a common, a very common ideology that I see, um, whether it's like, you know, just in word of mouth or on social media that people are like, you know, let's help the people who are around us first. Um, and yes, we should most certainly help the people who are around us. This organization also has been providing food for, for the homeless in Oshawa every Sunday for the past like year and a half at this point. Um, but I also think that just because there is a hundred miles, 200 miles, a thousand miles between you and somebody who else need and somebody else who needs food, doesn't mean that the obligation lessens because of that geographic, uh, distance. And so right. what this organization is trying to do is encourage empathy across borders. And the way that we plan on doing so is by rehumanizing, rehumanizing the people who need help by allowing them a platform to tell their stories. So we're trying to create a website, an Instagram, uh, an Instagram page where uh, if somebody is willing and consenting, 
after we give them the ration package, they can explain who they are. Just just a narrative of who they are. Like, mm-hmm. suppose my name is Hamza. I have a sister, two parents. I live in Ajax and, you know, whatever I think defines me as a person. Um, right. And just reminding everybody that, you know, I know this person's across the border and you might not be able to physically see them, but they need your help and they are somebody else who you could directly empathize with. Oh, that's amazing. So they get to just like tell their, their own story kind of thing. Yeah, just, just tell their own story. And that's, that's the goal of the research project to, to find a way to rehumanize people and make people connect across borders despite not being able to be in direct contact. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited for it. Yeah, um, because I was going to say, like, the people, like, here in Canada, we don't really think about that, like, with the, with everything that's going on with the pandemic, we don't really think about the fact that we do have, like, we have the CERB, we have, um, you know, landlords who are willing to freeze rent or for some, whoever needs that, or, um, you know, like, OSAP um, paused loan repayments for a couple months. Um, I can't remember how long, but they froze that. And, but in other countries that have even more strictly enforced lockdown than we have don't have any of that. And you don't kind of, you kind of don't really realize that because we've always had that kind of social security, but other countries don't have that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the biggest concerns that we have. So hopefully we can break that barrier. Yeah, hopefully you guys, good luck with that. It sounds like an amazing amazing project and hopefully you guys can uh, get a lot more. It sounds like you've got a lot accomplished already though. Thank you, thanks. But hopefully that momentum keeps going for you. <laughs> and you also asked about uh, other charity work just for the sake of yeah. putting this charity out, uh, <laughs> out there. It's yeah, uh, sure. Love146, I was the president last year um, and I've worked with them for two years now. Um, Really great organization. So what they work towards is uh, the re- paying for uh, funding the rehabilitative processes of victims of human trafficking. And okay. this, is, this is another issue that a lot of people think is extremely remote um, mm-hmm. and that we don't have to worry about because it's not within our direct purview. Uh, this is actually a total misconception. Um, I, I'm sure you've seen in the news in Mississauga yeah. and Toronto that there are human trafficking rings going around, one right next to my school even. So uh, this wow. is something that, yeah, our, our charity effort this year raised uh, over $4,000. So that's a huge accomplishment. Yeah. On our end. yeah. And even with the pandemic, right? So we ended up losing uh, a good chunk of uh, about like 30% mm-hmm. of our school year, right? So yeah, if uh, any listeners are interested in that, you know, uh, you could just Google U of T, Love146. There's also the parent organization, which you can also donate. Yeah, to we'll put right a, it has a website, right? Yes. Yeah, we'll put a link to the website in the, um, the article that will go along with this. Um, we'll put a link to all of this in there, but yeah, that's, um, a, a, you're so on point with that. Cause a lot of people don't realize that human trafficking happens here. Like I live in Niagara. That's where I am right now. And I think it was last year, the year before there was this really big sting, like right here in, I think it was Niagara Falls. Yeah. Um, and there was this, this really big thing. And a lot of people in the community were kind of shocked, like what? This is, is this real? And it's like, it's yeah, happening it's, right it under happens, our noses, right? It happens yeah. everywhere. And people don't realize that. So that is really, really valuable work too. It sounds like uh, you've been doing a lot of very fulfilling things. Yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been an exciting year. And everybody who's involved, I feel like, is genuinely involved. And uh, I've even gotten some of my, like, guy friends into this because this, this does impact women disproportionately. Mm-hmm. Um, although it does impact men as well in, yeah. in, in instances. But uh, I, I think there's a huge lack of a male presence within these issues, right? Like totally. Was, there were a couple executives last year who were males, but our events were predominantly filled with females, especially like our education awareness events. Those were yeah. always women who were attending because they recognize how serious the problem's getting. And we're trying to yeah. mobilize a lot more men to get involved. Yeah, that's a great angle to do too. I think obviously the more awareness in general uh, but yeah, like obviously as a female, I'm, I understand exactly where you're coming from because we are, I think that females are just more trained to think like that automatically and are more, I guess, more aware of um, the threat of the problem, I guess you could say. Yeah. So yeah, that makes sense. And you said you worked, you work part-time? Yeah. Where you did? Mm-hmm. How did you balance all of that 
it was terrible. <laughs> it was uh, absolutely awful on some days, um, <laughs> especially somebody who commutes, which it's an hour by drive from Ajax to Toronto. But yeah. on a busy day um, when, you know, not everybody's quarantined mm -hmm. and you're taking public transportation, it could take about an hour and a half each way. Wow. And so when somebody's playing, I was playing uh, tri-campus hockey, which is the level right below varsity hockey uh, mm -hmm. at U of T. And I would have practices that would start at 10 p.m. and finish at 11, or games that would start at 9.30 and finish at 11. Right. And, and I would have, a, suppose, a class that starts at 8 a.m. even. And so I'm leaving my house to, to, to make it to a test that starts at 8 a.m. So I'm leaving at, like, 5.30 in the morning. Oh, my gosh. Waking up, right? Um, and then I arrive to my test, write my test, suppose. There's, there's actually this one one photo actually there's multiple photos of this one instance in my political science class uh at convocation hall it's one of the biggest uh lecture halls in the university of toronto and it's me falling asleep in the first row <laughs> right like right in front of the professor and it's like pictures from all angles because like everybody saw this and obviously um, everyone thought it was hilarious yeah everybody thought it was <laughs> hilarious um I, and i really did enjoy the class it wasn't uh for lack of like interest it mm -hmm. was just i was just purely exhausted um Dude. And sometimes I think that that university isn't like an aptitude test of four years, but it's just like who can endure the most suffering sometimes. <laughs> like it's like who can stay up the most? Who can um, if they're if they're tired, can they still pursue something? If they're you know if they're even like mental health issues, right? That stuff mm -hmm. goes rampant. Um, of course. If they're able to seek help, or, like get back on the horse. Um, they have like proper social systems surrounding them to support them when they do fall. Right. Mm -hmm. um, like it's not, it's not just like an uphill incline. And I think people always need to remember that, that, uh, you know, you're going up and then you drop and it's like, it's an absolute roller coaster. And that's okay. what my degree was like. There's some <laughs> days where I would leave my house at like seven in the morning and I wouldn't arrive to my home until like one in the morning. Oh my gosh. Because it would be like filled with class. I used to work in between classes. So okay. it would be like, I would, have my 10 a.m. to 12 um from 12 to 12 30 i'd eat my lunch and get changed because i'd wear a suit mm -hmm. um and then from 12 30 to 6 i'd work i'd have a class at 6 10 that i would usually be running late to to eight o'clock and then a tutorial from eight to nine eat dinner and then from uh that would be from nine to ten and then ten o'clock i'd be on the ice up until 11 and then drive home afterwards wow yeah, so, yeah, it was ridiculous. But at the same time, like, it's extremely fulfilling. Like, you got to, like, I made the most out of my degree. Like, I can mm -hmm. certainly say that. It right? sounds like it. It sounds like also, too, there's not a lot of time to be, like, to get bored or yeah, sit around yeah. wondering what to do. <laughs> yeah, and you're always socializing, right? Like, yeah. Uh, it, in a sense, like, you always, the, they're, they're friends in the Peace, Conflict, and Justice Studies program was uh, exceptionally difficult in its second year. There was a huge learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, and just like because we're marked almost like on a bell curve initially. Okay. And so the nature of entry for the program is quite stringent. And then once you've entered, now you have to at least try to aim for the top of a class. And when everybody's, you know, always accomplished quite a bit, it's difficult to, to land within that top 20% threshold. Um, but you're studying with this group of kids and you're basically like, I remember there's uh, two days that we scheduled our sleep around one another so that we'd be working <laughs> on this document together at all times. Wow. Yeah. So around the clock, we were just working together. It was, uh, and like, I mean, how, how much closer can you make friends like with, with, <laughs> that, with that type of experience? Like I've never worked with anybody like that in my right. life. Right? Well, you already have matching sleep schedules. I mean, you're yeah. already <laughs> a pretty good head start. <laughs> yeah. You must think I'm crazy. Holy smokes. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't. Um, so with all that, how did you, I was going to say, how did you manage to fit studying into all that? But I guess you kind of just answered that when you were, you had study. Did you rely a lot on study groups being something? Uh, I, I think so. It depends on the study group. I think there's uh, something that's always emphasized within IR, IR is the tragedy of the commons, environmental law, international relations, peace, conflict, and justice studies. Um, tragedy of the commons, if you're familiar with it, is... Uh, or, or even uh, it's a free rider problem. So, you know, you see something that's getting done and you allow it to happen as opposed to contributing because you know that you're going to benefit from it. Right. But uh, there's no reason to contribute. So a lot of those large study groups, the large documents on the Facebook groups were so futile because there would be like 300 people on this document all waiting for one another to fill it up. <laughs> right. And so 
I, I think uh, a huge part of it was uh, having that direct social connection. Uh, I tended to make those those documents with a, a group of four, and generally not larger than that. And yeah. it's extremely exclusive. We just keep it to ourselves um, because we don't want to like offend anybody for not like, not reaching out to them or whatnot. But I think there's an element of accountability in having a small group and seeing everybody every single day and delegating work prior to it being put out because that way you ensure that people actually get their work done and you know mm -hmm. everybody's rewarded to the same degree and everybody puts in the same amount of effort. That makes sense. That also makes sense to do it in those smaller groups too because everyone's kind of with a smaller group you can hold each other accountable and directly be like, hey, how come so-and-so hasn't shared anything or hasn't yeah. contributed? Because you can see a lot easier who's being, who's actually being involved. Yeah, yeah. And there's a level of trust, right? Like there's yeah. uh, the way the system worked was, uh, and it's almost like Machiavellian when you think about mm -hmm. it, but there was uh, one girl who used to always organize it. Um, and she was just great for organizing things. Like she was always on top of everything. And she would reach out to all of us individually and then she would, uh, make the make the doc and she'd be the one responsible for putting all of this like the culmination of it together a final product and yeah so she would be reaching out based on how well she knew the person whether she knew that they were like academically successful whether she knew that they were reliable and whatnot so everybody within the group had a level of trust for one another so there was never at least the stress of not being able to complete the study document I mean that's good that's always I know there's a lot of people out there who just dread doing things in groups and just cannot like yeah. I always hated doing things in groups because I hated relying on other people because I just would just get anxiety trying to wait for things for people and so it never works for me but if it does work for you I think that's a really great tool to use yeah that that, that definitely can be the case I've had I've had instances where you know I'm like okay I guess it's time to like put everybody on my back right <laughs> yeah uh but you know as long as you know who you're getting in with um and, and what this like social contract is to entail i think you should be fine yeah. so that's that's definitely a recommendation for me if you're in a small <laughs> program um definitely see who you could uh who you can meet up with who you work well with you'll have ample opportunity to do so and it's just a huge asset honestly yeah i mean that like it is i can see why it can be um are there any, so when you're saying how that crazy demanding schedule was really just chaotic for you, was there anything that, any kind of um, little tricks or anything you did to try to get through that? Like, did you stick to a schedule or did you um, try to use like a plan or anything or did you just kind of go with the flow? Um, if... I, I would recommend that people use planners. It works for a lot of people. It doesn't work for me, unfortunately, um, because the average person forgets to do something. I forget to look at my planner. <laughs> so as, as, as it may be recorded, I just, it's not within my nature to go and check it on written paper. I would, first and foremost, say keep in contact with good people, and I think that's the most important thing to get you through it. Um, I have friends from high school who I still cherish to this day. Um, and during my degree, we used to see each other whenever, whenever we we're available. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing to have somebody who's there to support you. I think also living at home was quite helpful because I had my family at all times to be like, if you're, you know, if you're slacking, they're like, Hey, pick it up. Like, what are you doing? Um, or additionally also, you know, they were there for my triumphs, for my failures. So if I was ever failing at something, they were there to pick me up, uh, emotionally and support me and be like, you know, this isn't the end of the world. You can always recover from this and uh having them there was uh one of the best decisions that i've ever made yeah yeah because then they can see you like hey you're burnt out they're not afraid to tell you hey you're burnt out maybe you should just chill today <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was quite helpful yeah it sounds like it um what is one of your favorite memories so far in your school academic career hmm. uh I have one that's socially and then one that's also just like purely academically. It's talking about the grind. Um, okay. I, I like to color code my uh, cue cards whenever I'm studying. And so I had a test where they told us that we would have identification materials, which is they would give us a concept within one of the readings. We calculated it was about like 1700 pages that we would have to find a concept from. She didn't give us like a list. She was just like, they're not going to be too big and they're not going to be too small. 
So that practically means anything. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like so, anything. so when we're, we're detailing this document and now I'm like recording everything off of Google, Google Docs to hand. Um, yeah, I ended up uh, making this entire collection of cue cards that were covered all over the floor of my room on the walls and everything. Um, I don't know if you, if you watched Spider-Man when he was trying to figure out, uh, like what happened to his parents, the, mm -hmm. the amazing Spider-Man and, and mm -hmm. he had like all of these diagrams all over his walls and everything. And my mom yep. entering the room and she's like, Oh my God, what's going on with this kid? I think that was the, the funniest based on like the grind academically. And that's one of the weekends that we actually ended up like coordinating our sleeping schedules and stuff is one of the most difficult tests <laughs> I've ever done. The final question was solve the Israel-Palestine conflict. So, <laughs> was that on your cue cards? No, it was not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Oh. I, did not. I never imagined something like that would be on a final exam. Um, so, and we had 30 minutes to answer that question. Oh. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a, a big deal. Um, and then the second one was um, after we finished up an exam um, and we all went to this pub that we always go to. Um, it's a... Uh, they, they just like sell like decent food for, for the price that it's at right across from campus. And we always used to go there. Um, and there's also the Maddie, which uh, I'm, I think a lot of U of T from students would be familiar with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of us just like recounting the end of the semester because that was our final exam. And it was like the end of our third year. And we, we sat there for like hours just talking about um, not only how things went, I guess everybody always has that discussion for 30 yeah. years afterwards, but like just enjoying each other's presence. Um, for like the first time non-academically and getting to know each other, I think was a huge step for us. Yeah. So it's a lot of that um, goes back to that social element, I guess for you it was probably a highlight or it seems like that um, the whole social aspect is something that you really um, valued and probably and still do obviously, but. Um, yeah, I cherish it. And I think one of my biggest regrets in some instances was uh I came from a, a different background from a lot of these students mm -hmm. um, and being in this new environment where I'm coming to class in sweatpants quite generally <laughs> pretty much every single day of the year um, and seeing kids who are dressed really nicely like in blazers and suits and whatnot um, and some of them are like you know my parents my my parent is a judge or my parent is a lawyer and they have like this type of background mm -hmm. um, I think was quite intimidating for me initially. Um, and then you, you think you're not going to find your clique. And so that was a bit of a barrier initially. And, and one of my regrets is like maybe putting up those walls initially mm -hmm. because you didn't actually get to know a lot of people who you might be stoked to know afterwards. And, and a lot of people within my program actually got into University of Toronto Law. So on the orientation day, I got to meet students who were in my class for four years that I just never spoke to <laughs> and realized that they were amazing people. Yeah, you had to just had to look past the suit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's yeah, that's that's funny. Most of the um, most of the people I went to school with didn't didn't just wore pajama pants to class half the time. So I can't imagine someone showing him up into what I would have done if someone had shown up to one of my classes in like a suit. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I guess in journalism, no one really has comes from that background. So. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's also the nature of the program, right? Yeah. These are kids who are go-getters and they're excited to like be networking or whatever job they have on the side. Or I'm not exactly sure what they were doing at that time, but uh, I personally was just trying to get by. <laughs> yeah, I get that. <laughs> um, on the flip side of that, what um, what are some of the struggles or challenges that you faced as a student? Probably, I'm assuming um, that the whole managing that chaotic schedule was probably a pretty big challenge for you but yeah so time time um time and I think also commuting was quite difficult for me mm -hmm. uh if you have the means to you probably shouldn't if it's not very if, if it's a short distance maybe fine but uh an hour and a half I think was a little excessive and that's mm -hmm. why next year I'm like I think I'm gonna have to draw the line although now it might be online schooling so who knows um yeah but yeah, so, so it was time, but also I think when I made that sacrifice, uh, I also have to recognize that, that was coming from a position of privilege, that I had somebody who was like an hour and a half away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's plenty of people who would like die for a place to live um, during an undergraduate because now they're incurring all this debt, right? So mm -hmm. at the end of the four years, like I was like, wow, that was a rough time. But uh, 
now that I'm thinking about it, perhaps it wasn't terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's a good way to come out of all of that instead of like struggling under all that student debt. And especially if you're, I mean, if you're living in Toronto, that's ex- expensive. Yeah, so yeah, it is expensive. And it's and, nice to avoid it. And then you have to pick up extra hours and stuff as well to make mm-hmm. up for that if, uh, you know, if you're paying it through your own means. So, like, I mean, maybe there's a, a cost benefit to it. Maybe it is uh, beneficial, but you're, you're the person who has to make that deliberation, right? Yeah. Because, yeah, commuting is not for everyone, but not everyone can afford um, those living expenses. So I guess it's kind of a two-way street. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so in your opinion, how is university different from high school? And I know most people say uh, it's completely different, but what changed the most from high school to university for you? That's actually a funny story. My first year, I thought there was absolutely nothing different. (laughs) Um, In my first year, I took five full year courses. Um, The way it works at the University of Toronto is you can take a half year or a full year. And generally it's characterized, your, your timeline will be characterized by both. I took five full credits. So that meant that all my final papers, all my final exams were at the very end of the year, so around March, April. Um, Up until then, my degree, the first year of my degree, wasn't extremely onerous. So um, I thought it was a breeze. Like, I'm like, okay, there's readings that I didn't do that often. Um, And I would show up to classes. They were extremely interesting. I was meeting new people. I'm like, this is the life. Like, I'm, I'm loving this, right? Um, and then later on, I was up for a rude awakening around February when, when they're like, all the readings will be on the exam. And I'm like, whoa, I'm way behind. And that's when I started to have to catch up. Um, and, and, and that brings me precisely to my point. The difference is that you need to have a lot of self-discipline. In high school, you would have a teacher who would be like, don't forget, this is due tomorrow. Don't forget, this is due next week. Um, or you should have already started your ISU, your independent study unit. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that was all pretty much prescribed to you now in university it's like you have three deadlines on the syllabus figure it out Mm -hmm. and it seems like it's very low stress initially because there's nobody reminding you that all this thing that all these things are due but uh if you lack self-discipline this could be extremely challenging for you and i think that was a big jump for me (laughs) yeah i think that's a big thing a lot of people tend to struggle with a lot of the people that we talk to that's kind of one of the biggest things. It's like, I'm, I'm accountable for myself and no one's going to tell me when to study because I have to know that. Yeah. And, and, and also socially there's differences, right? Yeah. There's, uh, now I think once you hit university, you start to decide who your friends are. I feel like yeah. to, to an extent in high school, you're in a level of captivity where you're in a class of 30 people and you know, it's just in your best interest to get along with people and you see every, somebody every day and your friends. But uh, at this point, it's not effortless. You have to reach out to your friends if you want to maintain that relationship. And uh, which I think also is like something that speaks volume in a way, because if somebody's messaging me at this point, it means a lot more than it was uh, four years ago. Yeah. I think I agree with that too. I think it definitely has a different meaning now too, especially um, when, yeah, when people are taking their time out of their day to talk to you and, um, just to check in on you. It means a lot more now. Yeah. Um, on that note, if you could go back and talk to your high school self, let's say like your 15 year old self, what would you tell yourself? Um, stop goofing off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I would do everything the exact same way that I did. Um, I know I, I applied myself in high school to an extent, but just not to the maximum extent, which I think is mm-hmm. when I started university late first year is when I really started uh, to, to apply myself. I think in high school, I was somebody who would uh, go with the flow. Maybe, you know, you had your daily math homework. I would do it on occasion. Uh, I would be deeply socially involved. I would play a lot of sports. Uh, I, was, I was having a great time. Sorry, my internet connection says it's unstable. Can you still hear me? Yeah, I'm, it glitched for like a second, but I th- you're still good. Okay. Yeah. So I think um, that that was a very vital point in my lifetime to enjoy. And if you say in retrospect that you should have 
you know, started working harder in elementary school so you could have done better in high school, so you could have been, done better in university or been more equipped in the future. I think you'll never actually get a point in your life where you will enjoy yourself. So mm-hmm. I think if I were 15, if I were t- talking to myself if, when I was 15 years old, I'd be like, keep doing what you're doing. You're having a good time. And, you know, there's going to be times to work. Um, and right now you definitely should be working to an extent. But I think, you know, you're 15 years old. Have a good time. Enjoy yourself. Yeah, plus everything you did, if you did it all differently, maybe you wouldn't be where you are right now. Yeah, maybe perhaps. Maybe you would be somewhere else. Yeah, there's people who, who get burnt out by the time they get into university, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, what advice would you give for someone who's starting university like this year? I know this year's kind of weird circumstances because everything's online, but um, what kind of generic advice would you give for first-time students? Um. Hmm. definitely don't judge a book by its cover. Again, another cliche phrase, but uh, I think it's uh, pretty vital for somebody to reach out to new people to, to expand their social horizons. And for me, I had uh, quite like a generic friend uh, or like an archetype that I would be uh, compelled to look for. So there were certain individuals that I would be really attracted to as, as my friends. And then I was meeting a whole host of like diverse people. And I'm like, I don't know if I would connect well with this person, you know, maybe their political views don't align with me, or maybe they're too outspoken, or maybe they're too passive. Um, And I think you start to realize, and especially group is so diverse that uh, maybe that's just a consequence of my personality, but you, you get along with a lot more people than, than you think you do in high school. And you should definitely expand your horizons and meet a lot more people because it, uh, it helps you grow yourself like uh in terms of character and also intellectually yeah i think that's uh that's a really good thing that a lot of people um should remember because i know it's completely like in high school you have this mentality where you're like oh i don't want to talk to those people i don't want to talk to those people like in my high school there were the hallway kids and those were like all the kids that would eat their lunch in the hallway and they were kind of like the misfits yeah. It was like, oh, the hallway kids. But now it's like, I like those people are just as successful as everyone else. And they probably could have been a really good friend to you if you just talked to them. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We had, we had a, a hallway where I think there were kids, it was called the library hall is what we mm-hmm. pegged it. The library hall kids. And they used to play like Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh or something. Yeah. Um, and so everybody's like, you know, stay away from that. That's a social catastrophe. We don't <laughs> want to be around that. And, and like, Lo and behold, two years later, I'm on my virtual reality set playing Skyrim for like 13 hours a day. And you're like, wow, who are you? I don't even know. Like you, you develop in weird yeah. ways. And I feel like discounting somebody else for their interests kind of hinders your own development. So just embrace totally. it. 100% I agree with you on that. Um, so lastly, I just have a couple more questions here. Um, one of the things that we always ask in our interviews is, um, if you can share any favorite motivational quotes you might have, or just any favorite quotes in general that might be, that inspire you. Yeah. Um, that's a tough one. I honestly, I was thinking about it and I'm like, I, I don't know which one, because when, when you think about those famous motivational quotes, you think about like a lot of people who you would be compelled to believe in because of like their accomplishments and whatnot but then there's other people who also contradict them who you're also compelled to believe and I think uh there's one that that I believe is quite neutral in terms of what it tells you um and it's uh by Heraclitus and it's uh the only thing that is constant is change and I think that is quite ubiquitously correct like uh that's unequivocally correct because we all know that the world's changing especially you know given our circumstance Mm -hmm. right now but even with like technological improvements, changes, the social climate changing, the political climate changing, and we have to recognize that we have to adapt. And I think within my past four years, within my undergraduate degree, I have changed drastically. Like I, I, I don't know how I would even recognize the person that I was when I graduated from grade 12 uh, from high school. So I think recognizing that growth doesn't necessarily yeah, so recognizing that the change is necessary and the growth is necessary and that you're never in a point in your life where you shouldn't be growing or where you shouldn't be changing. And there's even people like within their 50s who, are, who I've seen within my courses taking their undergraduate degree courses just for the sake of personal growth, right? Um, and I think 
that those people are actually always the most interesting and that uh you know typically there's students who are like i'm 21 i'm going to sit with somebody who's 21 and I, I i like to be surrounded by those people because they offer a very different perspective and presence mm -hmm. um like shirley from the community from community mm -hmm. you know that show yeah she's yeah. Uh, somebody who's interesting offers a very different perspective yeah um, and i yeah i think always changing remembering that uh, you're in a position to grow is the most important thing that you should be uh striving towards even if it's like law school med school it doesn't even have to be any of that stuff but just grow for yourself grow for your own purposes yeah that makes total sense i had a, a couple people like those um like the mature students they were called at my school i yeah. had a couple people like that in my classes too and everyone's kind of like this person doesn't really fit in here but they were really nice like really interesting people who obviously they have so much more to share so it's so much worth it to talk to them yeah, I think in, in undergraduate degrees, it's a little bit more peculiar because they're they're not like the yeah. typical student. Um, in, in degrees like like uh, your MD or your JD, it's a little bit more common because you, those are the types of people you actually see, right? Like it's not uncommon to find a mature student. In fact, the yeah. UT offers uh, family housing. So it's like for spouses, for children as well, mm -hmm. um, for, for their JD students. So like, I mean, it's, it's not uncommon for you to see that, but in spaces like a bachelor's degree, I guess, people tend to be a lot more closed minded and they're like, this is yeah. the type of student that I'm used to seeing. And this is abnormal to me almost. Um, and yeah, I would definitely say reach out to those yeah, people, like, make them feel at home, like not only for yourself, but also for them. Like, you know, maybe they also want to experience what college is like and, and uh, expand their social horizons as well. And they're bettering their lives, like you said. So you got to admire them for doing that. It's pretty brave. Yeah. So uh, the last one of the last few questions we always kind of um, end with a, more, a question that's more on the fun side. And that would be, what is your favorite social media platform and why? Okay. So this is a, a guilty pleasure. I've been trying to get rid of social media for like a long time <laughs> in terms of Fair enough. like, I, I recognize it's uh it's merit and, and having like a presence there, but uh, personal with my personal engagement, I've been trying to reduce it as much as possible. Um, and, and my guilty pleasure is, 100% Instagram like I uh I, especially when the amount that I am required to read for school or required to read for my additional you know extracurricular tasks and whatnot the internships that I've done have been like purely research-based or talking to clients and correspondents and whatnot and Instagram is just one of those places where you, you can it, it's like a narrative in a picture right mm -hmm. um and and just being able to see that with like how how low the like the mental requirement is to be on Instagram, I think is quite nice. And that's why it's so captivating to a lot of people. Um, and also I think it, uh, in terms of me, who's eager to learn, I think is quite interesting in terms of uh, how much you can see within Instagram. So if you go on like the discover page, mm -hmm. even if you, uh, if you type in like a location, my friend and I used to do this all the time and just like tag each other in pictures for different locations, you see what's going on somewhere else in the world on a different continent, yeah. I think is just absolutely mesmerizing that you're able to do that on a social media platform. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, Instagram. And then I'd say Facebook as well, because, uh, but that's just for more like news engagement, political engagement, I think uh, that a lot of people for some reason find Facebook to be the place to post uh, political opinions, which I just yeah. find interesting to read. I've noticed that a lot too. That's pretty much all. <laughs> Facebook's been pretty uh, active lately with uh, the pandemic yeah, so, and everything. Yeah, so, and especially the, the couple cases in the past uh, few weeks, right? The mm -hmm. Recently, which are tragic. Yeah. So I think that, yes, Facebook is still pretty valuable for the news and stuff. But yeah, that's super interesting. Um, just before we wrap up, do you have any final insights uh, that you want to share with our audience? No, no, I'm all set. I think uh, I've spoken quite a bit already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you've definitely um, given us so much to think about. So um, I just want to thank you for joining me today. Uh, thanks for taking the time out of your day to talk to me today. Thank you for having really me. I appreciate it. No problem. And uh, we'll definitely keep in touch. And um, yeah, we'll see how, see how it goes for you. Okay, absolutely. I'll keep you updated on uh, whatever happens. Perfect. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.